December 15th, Dr. C. Patient notes. The abnormality of her psychic state has induced her to lead a life which is irregular and tends towards delinquency. Of fickle and flighty character, she regularly discards her household duties and engages in occasional prostitution. Prostitution? Me? No, I don't think I could have... Or are my memories deceiving me? What other horrible things could I have done without even realizing? The uncertainty, the fear of my own actions was one of the things that tormented me most. Her mental deficiency makes her deaf to the reprimands of her family. She has shown suicidal tendencies. She was brought to the ward yesterday, agitated and hysterical. Treated with cardiazole, two injections a week for five weeks. The therapies removed the light for a while, but also all her will, desire, and hope. It was torture, but we had no choice. Nobody explained anything. No one tried to help us understand. We were like farm animals. June 2nd. After a long period of calm and improvement, the patient is very agitated today and vehemently refuses to submit to a gynecological examination. She swears and curses those helping her, flailing her arms and hitting them. According to reports by Dr. B, the patient has been subjected to periodic checkups since she had a spontaneous abortion about two years ago, in her third month of pregnancy. Conception occurred after she had sexual intercourse with a stranger who sneaked into the hospital grounds. Details are contained in the charges filed at police headquarters in Volterra, a copy of which is attached to these clinical notes. ES Therapy a spontaneous abortion? It's not true. I can't believe it. How could I have invented things if I didn't even know what they were doing to me?
and the stranger in the grounds. I don't remember. Was that another lie? Or was another memory removed? God, my head. June 13th. The nurses report that she descended into a state of great mental confusion after receiving her mother's letter. She threw her soup over another inmate because she was very anxious and then punched a nurse. Impulsive flails about her. She rails against the doctor in vulgar terms while he is examining her, lashes out and spits. Block all correspondence to give the patient no further reason to become agitated. August 20th, tied to bed. The nurses report that the patient is extremely agitated after the visit of a relative or family friend. Two days later, she is still shouting all the time that he commands her, that she must obey and harm herself, and that she is not Charlotte. All visits forbidden constrained to bed and intensification of ES therapy until we achieve results. Calm down. You must be calm. Don't get agitated. We'll make you calm down. Is that the only thing that matters? Is tranquility worth the price of not living? March 3rd, alert, correct attitude, replies when questioned. The nurses report that the patient is calm, she washes and looks after herself. She affirms the existence of a certain Amara. She says that Amara is a patient who disappeared when she was moved to this ward. No confirmation. Probably a regressive hallucination. Evaluate transfer. Did I imagine Amara? That's not possible. She was there. I know she was there. I feel it. She must have left some traces of her presence.
We can try to find her medical records in the archive where their letters were filed. saw a shadow cast against the wall by the light filtering in through the door. Then I heard the door close. heads of animals stuck where their own heads should have been. I would curl up on the floor and would even wet myself. The teacher would try to console me and would smile at me, but her teeth and her eyes would terrify me even more. Things did change. I don't know why, perhaps during the second or third year of school. It was more or less in the same period that I became friends with Bruna. I remember the sensation of joy I experienced when I felt almost normal. The light isn't coming. The dreams have gone. And I have a real friend. One who speaks to me. I would repeat this to myself proudly while looking in the mirror, where I no longer saw an embarrassing reflection. to me that the world was a difficult place, but it was no longer impossible. Bruna. I did not understand what Bruna saw in me, especially as she was almost two years older than me. I would tell her this every now and then, and she would joke about it, saying, Nothing. I don't see anything in you, which is what I like about you. And then she would hug me. One day, 
she was sad and pensive and said to me, You and I are the same. Don't be fooled. You are reserved and honest, and I'm not. But that's the only difference between us. The only one. Then she began to cry. I was struck by the perception in her words, but only today, after re-examining my past, do I understand what she meant. I no longer considered my body as something disgusting and ill, far from it. I began to look at myself, to caress myself, and smell my own skin. I began to explore and experiment, finding physical pleasure. My ideas were not very clear, and I never spoke to anyone about these things. Bruna, however, spoke about them. She boasted about her love stories and her young men. To my eyes, she was very lucky, always being wooed. My marvelous, generous, and kind boys. Thus, I fantasized about her adventures, pretending that I was the main protagonist. But how could I ever be like her? Occasionally, I recall that she had black and blue marks on her body, but I was so naive that I did not understand. I did not put two and two together. It was Don Gino who explained things to me a few years later. He told me about Bruna's father and brother, but I was already very ill. The light had returned, and that thing made me suffer even more. It was my world, and it was crumbling. When I spoke to Bruna about it, she turned her head away and was silent for a long time. Prince Charming doesn't exist, Renée. At least not for us. I was 14 years old. I didn't think it was possible for a boy to look at me and desire me. When he asked me if I wanted to go for a walk, I didn't say anything. I didn't even have the courage to look at him. Things improved for a number of years, then suddenly everything came crashing down. One evening, I came home drunk, and the following morning, a terrible crisis overcame me. All of a sudden, what had I done? I was terrified. I thought I'd lost my sight. The light burned my eyes from inside. The memories of the previous day emerged in bursts, images, flashes, which unleashed something monstrous inside me. Repetition of words was no longer sufficient. Now there was a voice in my head which repeated them louder than I did, and they were words of accusation and blame. So I covered my ears and shouted and hit my head against the wall and threw up. I remember the doctor, the wall filthy with blood and vomit. My mother wasn't looking at me. Bruna was crying but trying to hide it. Charlotte was beside me. I never told anyone what had happened. He came to visit me, but I refused to see him. I became agitated. I think he liked me, even though things turned out badly. In that period, I began to suffer from memory loss. The few things I learned didn't please me at all. He told me that I was looking for him. It was all my fault. Bruna told me that sometimes I got drunk. People in the village gossiped about me. Sometimes I was covered in black and blue marks. I didn't realize what was happening to me, what I was doing. 
I was no longer in control of my life. From my little corner. He felt accused, hurt. I chased him away. I insulted him. He was proud, handsome. He said things about me to other people, which he shouldn't have said. Mother caught me coming home drunk. She beat me and sent me to speak to Don Gino every day. He came back and tried to speak to me. I think he liked me. Sometimes I sent him packing and I started shouting at him. But other times I embraced him. I held him tight and loved him. But he couldn't bind himself to me. I was 16 and ill. I had no future. I didn't get out of bed for weeks. Then I did things I was ashamed of. I slept with men. The guilt tore at my soul. And the light came back to torture me. I invented stories to justify my actions. I couldn't bear my own weight. Mom found out about it. Her voice split my head. I pushed her away because I was afraid of dying, and I shouted to the whole world what was happening to me, and that I didn't understand. The police arrived, and they carted me away. I remember the onlookers shaking their heads. They would be better off without me, cleansed of shame, with something to talk about.
Amara B., aged 32, housewife, mother of two daughters, married to Mario B. So Amara does exist, yet she had no children and wasn't married, but that photo, it's her. June 3rd, 1936, admitted yesterday, showing signs of improvement. June 8th, cheerful, calm, and tranquil. Her behavior is good and she is keeping herself clean and tidy. Discharged on June 10th. April 28, 1937, arrived accompanied by her husband in an anxious and nervous state. Has difficulty speaking, trembles. Discharged May 14th, March 8th, 1938. A few days before Renee was admitted, she told me that she too had been admitted only a short time previously. Arrived yesterday in a febrile state. Discharged March 14th. She didn't leave. Certainly not after a few days. No. June 22nd, 1939. Readmitted once more. The patient shows rapid improvement. Discharged July 2nd. August 1st, 1941. The latest of many admissions due to agitation. Discharged August 27th. She came and went. Stayed only for short periods. But I remember she was always with me. Oh, what's going on? March 4th, 1942. Back again, the same situation. March 8th. Compared to previous admissions, the patient seems depressed even after a few days, although her demeanor is calm and she is attentive. Discharged March 25th. April 2nd. The patient is distracted and apathetic. Her husband brought her here and said, She's not eating, doctor. She spends all her time sleeping. I'm so worried, doctor. You know her. You can help her. April 6th. Tuberculosis. Patient transferred to the Maragliano Pavilion and is in isolation. May 3rd, 1942. Death from tuberculosis at approximately 8.30 a.m. Is Amara dead? Poor dear friend. I wasn't even able to say goodbye to you. Enclosed is a manuscript written by the patient, probably in a state of delirium. I'm dying. I know it. I'm losing a lot of blood, bleeding internally, too. It's strange. Since I came back in here, I can't stop thinking about that little girl with her sad eyes, her desperation. I only saw her for a short time, it's true, but she remains in my heart. Will she still be here? I hope to God not. I hope she's better and her mother's taken her home. My memories don't match up. What's the point of this? Perhaps my memory is playing tricks on me. Things are not as I remember them. As I see them. But she said she liked me. I just can't understand it. I just wanted to say goodbye to her for the last time. I never even said goodbye to her. How would a soul survive in this hell? I so want to feel things again. Pain, passion. Feel the damn tears rolling down my face. To remember that I was alive.